All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to another afternoon of our question series through the Northeast Tree Fruit IPM group. Um, excited to be hosting today's event. Today's topic that we're going to be tackling is what are the current trends and outlooks for protected culture production with a particular emphasis on multi-leader systems. So uh, we got an, a really nice group of people here to talk to us today, and I'd just like to thank them all again for joining us. So we have Michaela Rose, who's from the IRDA station up in Quebec. We also have Greg Lang from MSU, and we have Terrence Nenich, who graciously is coming out of retirement for the next 90 minutes to talk to us about his experiences as well. So um, really excited to have everybody here today. I think, you know, particularly just kind of threading it all together, the last two sessions that we had were really talking about how climate change in particular is going to be impacting tree fruit production. And so we've always kind of said, you know, there's only so much we can really do about the weather. So, um, you know, when we talk about putting tree fruit under under protected culture, and it really kind of helps us shift that a little bit. So, you know, it's certainly a topic that I'm getting more and more questions about, and I think others are too. So um, very interested to hear what you have found so far. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mikhail, who's going to be our first speaker today. So Mikhail, you should be good to share your screen and take it away for the group. Okay. So should be good? Looks good. All right. So uh, yes, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Michael. Um, I am a project manager at AIRDA, and uh, today I'll be discussing about two uh, research projects on exclusion nets. So the first began in 2012 and did in 2018. And following that, um, the second project uh, has begun in 2019, will be ending this year. Um, so let's begin. So first, I would like to introduce you to IRDA, which is a research uh, institute based in saint bruno de montarville um, So it's right here. Um, we're located roughly 25 minutes from Montreal and an hour from the United States, uh, Vermont and uh, New York. We have a research uh, orchard, experimental orchard, uh, which is roughly 10 hectares. Uh, we got all, all sorts of trees. So from big trees to really, really narrow row and multi-axis trees high density. So the, the first project started in 2012 and ended in 2018. And the main objective were to evaluate the effectiveness of the exclusion system and to learn to play with the nets because it was the, the, the first time that we had some nets in Quebec. So our main goal was to avoid pesticides application. We work mainly on onicris and we use the rootstock um, B9. Uh, we did install the net at the beginning of the season, just before the, the bud break. And after we removed them at um, harvest. Um, we did use a uh, ProtectNet uh, 60, so the mesh size is one millimeter by two, and we wanted to exclude the soil from the system, which is uh, something that is really crucial for interrupting the life cycle of several um, insects. To do so, we position um, a wire uh, roughly 16 inches above the ground, and we secure the net uh, onto the wire with uh, clips. We have um, six rows with nets and six rows without nets that we uh, that I'm going to call a control for the rest of the presentation. And the aim of the study was learning about nets, structures, pollination, pests, uh, biotic factors, and to run a rough economic analysis. So just to show you, um, this is the drone view of for um, experimental uh, unit. So you can see we are at Blossom, the nets are open for pollination, you can see the flowers. So that's the, the unit. Um, I'm gonna jump right into the results. So you can see on the y-axis is the average number of damage on the onycris apple at harvest. Um, the results are from 2012 to 2016. So you can see for codling moth, um, 
uh, there's an excellent management. Uh, you can see the blue is the control and the green, um, like this one, it's the, the net. So we had a pretty good, decent control for Codling Mod. Plum Curculio as well, a good control. Apple Southfly, um, the pressure was not uh, really tremendous in the orchard, but we saw a slight decrease. For the Apple Maggot, um, you can see that the pressure was really high in, in the orchard. Um, you got four little stars, which is uh, was um, significantly different for four years and for on five. So uh, we exclude almost all the apple maggot. And for the tarnished plant bug, um, relatively uh, similar. But for the OBLR, um, we had uh, really a, a good surprise. Um, we had more OBLR under the nets than outside, meaning that in two years, we saw a population increasing under the, the nets and there were more um, butterflies, well, a leaf roller under the nets. Um, <clears throat> our hypothesis is maybe is mainly because the OBLR can complete the life cycle on the tree. So if you put the net at the beginning of the season and the larvae is right on the tree, uh, you can imagine that it's there, it's good, plenty of leaves, plenty of fruits. Um, she can co complete the cycle right on the tree and we don't use any pesticides and the nets exclude all the predatories or parasites parasit uh, of the OBLR. So um, she's good to go. If we continue, um, I changed the y-axis into log just to fit all the data into one single graph. But uh, mainly what I want to show is regarding fruit quality, there was no difference in diameter, yield, uh, in between control and nets, which is a good thing. Um, for the fruit maturity index, uh, we saw a slight difference um, especially one year, um, there's a slight delay in the apple that were observed under the netting. Um, the slight delay is typically um, about three to four days. Um, and our hypothesis on this is that the nets act as a buffer against uh, temperature fluctuation towards the, the end of the season, causing, causing um, the small delay in maturity, which is not something that is so bad uh, if you wait two or three days uh, the, the the apple is going to be uh, as good as in the, the control so it wasn't a big deal next if we continue um so sugar concentration coloration uh firmness uh the green side and the the, the red side really really similar from control to the the fruit that were under nets um, where we saw a difference is uh, the number of seeds at harvest. Um, we had two years with less seeds um, in the net um, plot. Um, our hypothesis on this is that we think um, that we open we, we open only the nets for two days for pollination because we saw that beyond this uh, we don't have any more. Um, fruit lip and under the two days uh, we have less fruit lip so based on our trials two days is the best but the problem is that if you open the two days and it's windy or it's cloudy well I think it will affect the uh, pollinizator the bees so I, I guess um, that's what happened on the two years um, that we saw less seeds into the fruit um, we don't know what will happen with the apple because uh, we just observe them and throw it away. Uh, so we don't know in the long run if the apple is going to be good in um, AC chambers. Regarding the damage, um, if we consider the frost, we had one year with the frost episode in 2014. So we had a good protection from the net. I don't know why, but it worked. Um, and we had a really, really big episode of hail uh, in 2015. So there was uh, roughly 70% of damage in the control plot and less than 1% in the, under the net. So it really worked. 
and rusting, uh, mechanical damage, and apple scab. Well, they are really similar. We have very few apple scab in the, the orchard. Now I present the temperature curve. Um, these are temperature curves that were recorded from 2012 to 2017 or 18. Um, the sensor were installed in the month of May and removed in September, and the data were recorded every hour. So that's a lot, a lot of data. So I would like to um, draw your attention on the black line, which is the net, and the green one, which is the control. So we had observing early in the morning, uh, so from midnight to um, roughly 10 o'clock in the morning, temperature are the same. And after, uh, when the temperature rises around three o'clock, that's the, the peak, three to five, it's the peak. So you see the, the difference. And after, uh, as night falls, uh, the temperature returns to similar level. When we consider all the, da the, the data, um, there's approximately um, plus uh, 0 0.2 degrees Celsius difference from the control and the nets. So we thought that it's going to be really, really warmer under the net, but as it turns out, it's not. It's really not. So there's no problem dur during uh, big heat waves or during cold days. Uh, it's roughly similar. Hey, Michael, um, I see we have a hand up from Glenn. Glenn, did you have a question? Yeah, what's the red line? Uh, the different? red line, um, because we had some uh, um, anti-rain uh, tarp over the, the, the canopy of the tree, and we measured the temperature under those. But I'm not discussing the results uh, right now. So the red line is there, but uh, yeah, I don't talk about it. <laughs> but you can see that if you put a plastic film uh, over the canopy uh, is going to be less warm than in control. Am I answering right? It's good. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, perfect. So moving on to the other project, which is uh, I like to call the Orchard of the Future. Uh, well, I hope so. Um, this project began in 2019 and will be ending uh, this summer. So it's roughly the same um, team. Uh, so exclusion, abiotic factor, fruit quality. And we also focus on mechanical pruning that I won't get into it for the purpose of the presentation. And we also have multi-leader system. So we measure the phys physiology and performance yield. But uh, what I'm going to show you is just preliminary result. Uh, it's uh, the result are from last week, so it's really out of the oven right now. So bear with me with those results. So the exclusion system, uh, we have row by row, as you can see at the top image, and we have monoblock system, which is um, eight rows under the uh, same netting. Um, I will only discuss result on single row and no, not monoblock because we didn't get gather enough uh, data yet, but single row, we have a couple of data to show. We use um, um, nets from Artais, which is an Italian company. Uh, it's called four by four, uh, five by four, which the mesh size are a little bit bigger than the previous uh, study. So it's three by two. Uh, the other one was uh, one by two. So um, based on some study that trials that we did, um, bigger mesh allows a biological control. So uh, you can have good insects that can go through the meshes and still exclude the, the, the not good one. <laughs> so um, yeah, we use a bigger mesh and we measure uh, what will happen. We also included the anti-rain net, which is a net with really, really small mesh. So 0 0.03 by two. Uh, you can see it's the the, the white one, so it it, um, um, it reduces the rainfall onto the trees, and we use uh, the famous concrete post, uh, as you can see right here, and we use metal arches um, under the net just to get, to keep the, the the form. Yeah. So 
the experimental setup, uh, it was from a single row, uh, Freedom. It was planted in 2017 on B9 rootstock, roughly under 100 trees with a single axis. We have two treatments, net without nets, and we use uh, we didn't use any pesticides in the, the trial. So again, um, the results show a reduced damage from uh, green aphids um, under the nets. We had a good control of aphid midges. We had some ladybug inside, so this is a good thing. Um, a little bit of overfly, but not that much. And we had um, a problem with the uh, moon bug. So uh, it was a slight increase in damage. Take note that uh, those results are only for two years, so 2022 and 2023. And if we continue in terms of damage uh, at harvest, um, it was the results are really similar that what I presented it to uh, for Onicrisp. So for cotton mud, good exclusion, plum curculio as well, oyster shale scale a little bit under the nets, but uh, I don't know if it's different. Well, the trend is that we have more uh, less um, scale under the net. Apple maggot as well, a good control. Um, OBLR and mm, leaf roller, um, in general, there's a reduction of incidence under the net, was, uh, but we found some still under. So I guess the mesh didn't allow the parasitoid or predatories uh, to go through. And fly spec, um, there's a, a good pressure in of fly spec in 2022, 2023. And we reduce the risk of having fly spec under the net. However, the cause is unknown about this difference. We have to investigate. Um, 2023, we had, we, we had a really bad frost at the beginning of uh, the season uh, during blossom. So you can see that the net didn't do nothing. Um, we had the same damage. And for mechanical damage, um, roughly the same. Now, uh, the fruit quality of freedom. Uh, so, um, coloration, coloration, diameter, firmness, uh, it's the same. Number of speed um, tends to be a little bit lower. So, I guess we have a problem with the two days of pollination. Um, we have to, to take a look at um, what's really happening for pollination. Uh, maturity as well. Um, we have. Um, less mature is slight, slightly delayed under the net um so we're used to it uh, it's always two or three days um of maturity so yeah and weight same weight sugar content same so no problem there um regarding the abiotic factors of um yeah, exclusion net. We evaluate the light intensity under the nets using a device called the sun scan. You can see here, uh, we like to call it the magic wand. Um, this allows us to determine the percentage of light intercepted by the nets and the percentage of diffuse uh, light. In other words, uh, it provides the insight into the percentage of light available for photosynthesis by the plant with and without nets. Plus, we did gather data on uh, temperature, humidity, and everything, uh, only to determine if bigger mesh uh, change um, the 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 results that we have we had in the the past project. So. Um, Here's the, the graph of the solar radiation. Uh, so for photosynthesis, you have control, net, and anti-rain. And the control group, um, well, there's no barrier, so uh, there's no obstruction. So you have the solar radiation. If you add net, you lose a little bit of light. And if you add the anti-rain, you lose half of the solar radiation, which um, we think it's not a good um, a good investment, but it turns out that if you look at the diffuse light, under control, the diffuse light is lower, 
when you put nets, it's higher. And in, when you put anti-rain net, it's really, really, really uh, higher. So um, that indicates that there's more diffuse light available under the nets, provi providing enough light for photosynthesis. And I will come back to show you some uh, results on photosynthesis at the end of the, the presentation. Um, so, um, yeah, single row rubinola for the physiology aspect. Um, it was planted on rootstock G41 in 2017. It's the, we had three rows, roughly 100 trees, and we had, we have one, two, and four axes. Uh, we have various treatment, including no nets with mechanical pruning, nets with mechanical pruning, and manual without nets. So each treatment is repeated twice, and um, like I said before, no pesticides were used into the treatment. So at the end of each season, uh, we do me measure the height of each tree, like those two lovely ladies are doing at the end of season into the snow. We don't know what to do, so we just measure the height of the trees. Uh, it's really, really long, but it gives us a good insight of the, the growth and uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to do. And as well, we measure each axis uh, separately. And at the beginning of season, we take the diameter of the trunk at 30 uh, centimeters. So um, yeah, we calculate the TCA, blah, 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 blah. So the growth rate, um, here is, um, let's say that's 60%, 20%. You got the year 2020, 22, and 23. So for the one axis in Rubinola, you can see that here are all the treatment, which are control, edger, and net with edger, but I won't get into those details. The trend here is that every year, it's slow. the growth rate is slowing down because the tree is going up and up and up. And it's at maturity. So you can see that it's going down and roughly 20 something percent of growth every year. If you go with two axes, you can see something different that it's stable. So in first year, the growth rate is going down, but after it's stabilized and it's still around, I don't know, 30 something percent of growth between 2022 and 2023. So it's keep growing. And if you add one more, well, four axes, um, you can see that yes, it's going down, but still the growth rate is way higher if you have four axes. So that indicates that there's a greater growth uh, as the number of axes increases. Additionally, the trunk uh, get larger with more axes, which is really fun results. And the same principle here, um, but for the final height of the tree. So you have one meter 50, three meter 50. The dashed line represents uh, the top wire located at two meters 60 here. So for the one axis, you can see that in 2020, uh, I was there. And one year after, bam, it's at the, the, the top wire. And after it continues to grow, to grow, to grow, uh, which is well, usually you cut the trees, but we just let them um, grow. If you have two axes, well, you can see that in 2020 was there, 21 was there, and in 22, you reached the top wire. So you have a lag of roughly one year or two, depending on the treatment, uh, before you reach the top wire. And with the four axes, you can see that there's a really, really a big lag in, in time. So 2020 started really, really low and it took uh, four years um, to get to the top wire. So probably this year will be in production. Um, we're gonna leave a, couple, leave a couple of apple onto the trees. Yeah. Um, the photosynthetic activity. So yeah, so we saw that the net intercept light, but the diffuse light is there. So we use two uh, device um, for chlorophyll concentration and photosynthetic activity. So this is the chlorophyll concentration. Uh, you have one axis, two axis, four axis, and you got control, edger, 
and net with edger. So this is this one has nets, this one has no nets, so you can compare. But as you can see, there's no difference between treatment. So if you put net or you don't have any net or you pass the edger, um, it's the same. So the chlorophyll concentration into the leaves are similar, which is good. And if you look at the ratio uh, FV on FM, which is for the photosynthesis, um, in the green box here that I highlighted, uh, 0.8 is like the sweet spot for, for the tree. And as you can see, the same, same presentation here, one axis, two axis, four axis, control, edger, net, uh, and edger. So if you put a net or you have a control with one axis, it's roughly similar, four axis, and you do the same, same results. So um, I think that there is no stress onto the trees if you bend them to have four axes or you go tall spindle with only one axis. And I'm going to conclude on the yield. Um, it's only for 2021. Uh, so I guess there's a trend, but it's not um, really some final results. One axis, two axis, four axis. So you can see here in one axis, uh, you have manual pruning and here you have mechanical pruning. So there's a loss in yield. I don't know why uh, to explore those data, but you can see that it's going down. And what I like about the two and the four axis is that it's stable. So you can have the control or edger or with nets, you have the same yield here and there. So this, the, the hypothesis is that in a couple of years, the four and the two uh, axis will give a better yield than the one axis. So uh, we have to continue uh, the study for a couple of years to have those results. So for a summary of a single row exclusion um, from 2012 until today, um, we had a good protection against pest. Uh, mesh size, you can use both types of mesh, so one by two or three by two. Um, OBLR and aphids, uh, you have to take those uh, pests in consideration. If you don't apply any pesticides and you use nets, it might be a problem. Quality, um, the quality of the fruit is similar. Um, we have to investigate seeds and maturity just to know what's what's happening. Um, we had a good L protection, frost protection. It depends on the, 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 the temperature of the frost. So um, I guess it, if it's light, it can protect. If it's a big frost, um, not so, uh, not a good protection. In physiology, well, uh, there's a delay in, in the growth if you have more axis, but if you have more axis, the trunk will be bigger. And we didn't see any stress uh, on the trees. And yield, well, it has to be confirmed with more and more uh, years of study to be, to, to just to um, be sure that four axis will be better than one. And if it's con the consistency, in year. So I would just like to thank my team. Uh, without them, I won't be able to do all this, uh, this labor, all the students and the fundings and partnerships. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Does anybody have any questions for Michael before we, we move on to our next speaker? Feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask directly. I see Jeremy asked in the chat box, have you considered adding predators inside the netting? Uh, for aphid control or, or other um, things like lady beetle larvae or lace wings or anything like that? No, we, we, we didn't because uh, we just want to, 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 um, to learn how the systems work. Um, so our guess was uh, the predatory will come by themselves uh, with bigger mesh. It didn't really happen. So um, the next project we're going to introduce uh, probably ladybugs or something like that. Uh, but it, yeah, we're still trying to write it. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Glenn. When when do the nets go on in the spring? Um, and along those lines, you know, would an OBLR insecticide at half inch green knock them down before the nets go on, or what's your what's your timing for the netting? Uh, the timing it's just before uh, bud break, so uh, roughly end of April. We put the the nets on. 
Um, we didn't use any insecticide because we want to, to, to learn about the system, like I, I said before. But yes, that could be a good strategy to uh, pass an insecticide at the beginning of the season and closing it after so everything is clean. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a, uh, did you estimate the time labor needed to implement the netting? Um, and the follow-up, do you think your system is practical for growers or, or does it need adjustments still? Yeah, so um, that, that that's really the, the, the pain about nets. Uh, it takes a lot of labor. We have a lot of students. So for us in research and development, uh, it's easy. But to put this into a commercial orchard, we don't know yet. Um, we, we, we are currently working on some prototypes uh, to facilitate the labor. But right now, I cannot really answer this uh, this question. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I'll I'll just mention too. Um, you know, I work with a couple lard growers, and they're doing quite a bit with the drape net exclusion netting. Yeah. So that one, you know, you can kind of mechanically assist put it on your trees, and they've got hundreds of acres under cover now. So, um, you know, if that can be adaptable to that similar type of machine, I I could see growers really being interested. In yeah. It. Well, um, in in winter we don't uh, remove the nets; we just roll them up and. Uh, tie them at the the top rope and that's it so we leave okay. them into the field and the problem is that we have to exclude the soil if you don't do that you're gonna have a lot of problem because plum curculio uh, uh I, I don't i don't have any any idea, um more example but they they go to the ground and after they they come up so you have to exclude the soil and this is really the labor that takes a lot, a lot of time just to put those clips and roll the net and put the clips. So we're trying to uh, to investigate a way to um, automate. Well, that yeah, just to don't have any labor clipping the nets. Sure. And then one one other question I have, and maybe this is where it, it, we get back to our original stupid question idea. But um, with the amount of control you saw, I mean, commercially, is that are, would your commercial growers be happy with that amount of control or is it still too much damage? Um, what are what are your thoughts on that? I couldn't quite quite tell. Yeah, well, the, the damage is quite high uh, because we don't use any, any pesticides. Uh, we don't use any um, thinning agent, fungicide, uh, nutrients. So on Honeycrisp, uh, there's a lot of uh, physiology damage. Uh, like, um, I don't... I don't uh, remember in English, but the, the brown spotting um, on, on the honey crisp. Oh, uh, bitter pit. To, yep. uh, bitter pit. Yeah. Bitter pit. Yeah. Thank you. So a lot of bitter pit. Um, yeah. So commercially, I think you had to use uh, some treatment. Uh, maybe you can cut most of the treatment, but you have to leave. I don't know five treatment per year, maybe to have a good good result. So has to be investigated. Um, yeah, research is really a slow thing compared to uh, <laughs> commercial uh, orchards. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we had a note from Jeremy. PC larvae seems like good food, seem like food for good nematodes. Um, certainly something to keep in mind. And then um, I think just for time, we'll, we'll save this one as our last question for you. But um, I know you said you're, you're still going through the data, but any thoughts on how the eight row block compares to the single row at this point? Any any gut feeling there for Glenn? Um, yeah, we have a lot of foliar pests. Um, right now we are not in production. Uh, we're gonna be maybe this year or the in two years. So uh, we only evaluate the, the foliar pest and we have more foliar pests into the, the monoblock than outside. Um, and I have to tell you that uh, the control plot is uh, treated with uh, insecticides and fungicides. So we, we, we are not excluding the soil. Uh, there's a lot of small cracks and holes that insects can pass. Uh, it's not the perfect exclusion method, but um, you can enter really easily into the under the net. So we'll see in the couple of years. Um, I think it's a good compromise between um, yeah, reduction of pesticides and the use of net. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Really interesting stuff. So with that, we're going to switch our gears now, and we're going to have Greg Lang uh, tell us a bit about some of his work looking at 
uh, Stone Fruit Undercover. So, Greg, feel free to take it away. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so and I've got you foreseeing the presenter view. So if you're able to swap that display, that would be great. There we go. Looks great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> see if I can minimize this also. There we go. So Mike asked me to uh, share with you all um, our experiences over the last, I guess, 25 years now with multi-leader systems since we, since I first started uh, creating the UFO type architecture, planar architecture for cherries, and about 20 years worth of studies on various kinds of orchard covering systems for primarily sweet cherries. So I'll just uh, threw together a bunch of different slides, hoping that it would stimulate lots of questions and discussion. Um, I kind of break down orchard covers um, in the in the area of cherries to three types, pole and cable tent structures. As you see kind of here in the lower right hand side, that's a Vone from Germany covering system. They tend to be the least expensive. They can be movable or they can be fixed. Um, they can have different types of venting. These are all considerations you have to think about with the different types of covers. Let me see why, there we go. <clears throat> then we can look at high tunnels like you see in the top of the picture here. Um, and there we're thinking about multi-bay tunnels, um, what the snow loads might be. Uh, if it's a single layer plastic, typically for orchards, uh, heat retention is... Um, appreciable, but not necessarily significant other than a degree or two when it comes to spring frosts. And finally, greenhouse-like automated structures that open and close based on uh, inputs from things like uh, um, weather stations, uh, sensors. These are the most expensive, although they give you the most manipulation options. And so we've got a, a wide range of different types of covers, a wide range of costs, and a wide range of capabilities for adding potential benefits. Here's just some pictures of some uh, pole and cable row covers over uh, planar V sweet cherries in Washington State. Here's very narrow row covers over planar um, sweet cherries in New Zealand. Uh, some of the things to be thinking about here are how much heat is trapped under those covers in a hot climate. That can be a detriment in a cool climate that can be a benefit if you're trapping heat. If you're trying to advance bloom in the spring, you want to trap heat. If you're trying to ripen fruit in a in a less stressful environment, you don't want to trap heat. So there's there's always pluses and minuses based on what your main criteria are for having the covers. Uh, there's the... Oh, individual insect exclusion type covers like Mikhail just uh, talked about. <clears throat> and here's one of the retractable roof systems. Uh, this is out of Canada, the Cravo system that we've used. And they've come up with some other designs that are a little bit less expensive and still automated uh, tied into weather stations, which make them more labor friendly, but you pay for the upfront installation costs there. So the key question for any of these types of covering systems that uh, significantly modify the climate is what are the problem or problems that need to be solved? And certainly in cherries, we're looking to exclude rain to prevent rain cracking. Uh, there are other factors that we also can be thinking about. And so it's important to look at the cost of the system and think about how many different potential um, benefits one may get from the system. So you could ask beyond rain cracking, uh, is there a value to altering ripening time? Is there a potential for frost protection? Uh, how significant does that protection need to be? Might we be reducing diseases or reducing uh, fungicide sprays? Might we be reducing wind bruising, improving the packouts, uh, protecting from birds in the case of sweet cherries? Uh, is there an advantage and a value to pruning and harvesting in any weather? Um, particularly if you're a pick your own type operation and uh, you're, you're 
primary income comes from the weekend. If you have several rainy weekends in a row and your clientele can't pick the fruit, uh, certainly that's a major cost to you. So all the different factors you need to think about going into um, whether a covering system is going to be economically viable. Just some pictures of things that we've seen under the different covers. Generally, when we protect from rain, we protect from most of the bacterial diseases. We pretty much eliminate bacterial diseases, as you see here, both uh, leaf uh, bacterial spots and fruit bacterial spots. And under cherries, we can say that um, of the diseases we've got familiarity with, mildew tends to increase in the dry environment of a rain exclusion system. So that's a typical disease out west in places like arid Washington, eastern Washington. It's not that typical in the east, but when you put a cover up, it can become quite prevalent. However, cherry leaf spot, the fungus for cherry leaf spot, can essentially be eliminated when you eliminate rain splattering onto the leaves. Bacterial canker is another really uh, considerable uh, potential damage um, uh, disease for sweet cherries, as well as other stone fruits. And it can almost be eliminated under covers when you prevent uh, the dissemination of the bacteria through rain. And then fungal diseases like brown rot uh, occur just about on the same um, incidence as uh, outside with no covers at all. So we do need to uh, we found we do need to continue our fungicide sprays for brown rot, whether we're under a cover or not. Here are some pictures from apricots uh, under high tunnels, the beautiful leaves on the left, um, damaged leaves from leaf spot on the right. Here are some plum cots, same sort of thing, wonderful foliage on the uh, under the covers, uh, lots of damaged and, and diseased and lower photosynthesis going on in that foliage uh, outside. Here's a apricot Wilson delicious that has a beautiful finish on it when you exclude the rain and a terrible finish on it uh, with when the, it's exposed to the full environment. So just quickly summarizing, we can eliminate pretty much all the bacterial diseases that we've learned about um, as being important in a variety of stone fruits. And we can reduce or eliminate some fungal diseases, but not all, brown rot being one of the most significant. So when we put covers or netting systems, as Mikhail talked about, we're affecting light quality, we're affecting wind, um, <clears throat> and the, the wavelengths of light can play a role. Uh, we can get different plastics that transmit more infrared or transmit more UV or block those or, or various other wavelengths. And so that can have influences on the tree growth as well as the biological activity. One of the first things we learned when we put up our first cover about 2005 was that honeybees navigate poorly without openings uh, so that they can see the sky. So they will fly up and they will bounce off the top plastic covers trying to look at the, uh, get to the open sky where they can use polarized light to navigate their way in and out of the orchard. And we found that our fruit set was very poor that first year when we depended solely on bum on honeybees. However, bumblebees forage well under the covers. They don't require the same polarized light uh, to, to navigate around. And so we've always put bumblebees under our covers when we've used them at the time of bloom. Other insect navigation um, can be influenced by both wavelength of light uh, and whether they're day or night flyers. We've seen that Japanese beetles don't come in under covers to the same extent as outside. And one of my colleagues uh, who was looking at high tunnel tomato production found that uh, damage by tomato hornworm went up dramatically under covers. And what they found was uh, the hornworms fly, uh, the moths fly during the night, lay their eggs. So whether there's a cover up or not, they're not being influenced by any change in the wavelength of light. But the parasitic wasps that uh, parasitize the hornworms fly during the day. And so they were influenced and weren't coming in under the covers. So knowing your insect and those kinds of criteria for um, their navigation it could be a factor in covers. Also, of course, uh, if you, the cover is trapping too much heat 
during bloom, it can cause the ovules and the flowers to degenerate before fertilization can take place. So various factors to think about from <clears throat> both the insect and the, the tree uh, pollination fruit set points of view. Of our cherry insects that we uh, have noticed in our various covering systems, as I mentioned, the covers tend to reduce Japanese beetle infestations. There's potential for a greater increase in mites due to the, the drier climate. And we found very little impact on plum curculio, cherry fruit fly, black cherry aphid, SWD, or San Jose uh, scale. Um, all of these covering systems are open, let's say at the ends, or open between the panels. So they aren't, by any stretch of their imagination, insect exclusion um, systems. There's also the effect of um, these plastics that are UV stabilized, meaning they, they tend to screen out ultraviolet, can also affect things like cherry blush, the, the red pigmentation, the anthocyanins in the skin of yellow cherries. We found the same thing in apricots. There you see on the left, uh, beautiful apricots um, under tunnels, uh, but that's a variety that develops a really red blush and it only developed that red blush when it was outside with full ultraviolet exposure. So cherries and apricots seem to work the same in terms of the biosynthetic pathways for anthocyanins. But here, when we were looking at nectarines under covers and outside of covers, there was no impact on the, the red blush uh, formation on nectarines and peaches. The plastic, plastic covering systems uh, affect evapotranspiration uh, as well, uh, of course, as Mikhail showed, also affects uh, the diffused light uh, as well as the direct sunlight that comes through. And so these can impact water relations, uh, and water relations will then impact nutrient flow. And of course, photosynthesis can impact sweetness. So what we found in general in stone fruits has been fruit size generally tends to be a little bit more enhanced under covers. The fruit tends to grow at a uniform turgor throughout the day. There's no midday or late afternoon depression in the water relations in the, in the tree. And so we've tended to see a little bit larger fruit across numerous uh, stone fruit species. On occasion, we've also seen a little bit softer fruit, which we tend to ascribe to lower calcium uptake. While the rotor, turgor relations uh, stay consistent, Overall, evapotranspiration is reduced, and that means there's less calcium potentially coming in through that evapotranspiration stream moving into the fruit. And if we have anything that impacts um, photosynthesis negatively, it impacts sweetness. But we found that as we move to now sort of segueing into uh, multiple leader systems, narrow planar canopies, uh, that tends to be uh, much less of an issue. Here you can just see outside the, the shadows cast and inside that it fused light with no shadow cast. So thinking about shade as we've moved from three-dimensional canopies and what portion of those canopies are shaded and what portion are sunlit, you can sort of imagine the sunlit portions with this green line and the gray area being potential shaded areas. Those are leaves that aren't photosynthesizing at a high rate. And so uh, when Back in 1999, when we first started dealing with uh, developing planar canopies, we were looking at uh, this UFO, what ultimately became the UFO training system. And it really creates a canopy where all of the leaves are pretty much acting like fully sun exposed leaves. There's minimal amount of shade that's occurring in such a narrow canopy and a vertically growing canopy. An interesting study that was done by my graduate student at the time, Matt Whiting, looked at whole canopy photosynthesis, and you see light um, or ca whole, canop uh, whole canopy photosynthesis saturating at about 60 to 75 percent of full sunlight. And these studies were done out in Washington State. And so we always had said, you know, that's what we're looking for in an orchard, but that's a three-dimensional orchard. And if we look at single leaf photosynthesis, which are narrow planar canopies, are now much more like a mimicking a single leaf rather than a three-dimensional, potentially interior shaded canopy, we see that photosynthesis is opt being um, maximized at almost uh, 30 to 50% of full sunlight. And so it's 
important as we're putting shades over trees that if we move to a more narrow canopy, we're more apt to have minimal impact on that photosynthesis. And that's even more important, I think, here in the east, where we have a lot more cloudy days compared to out west. So we have cloudiness reducing our, our sunlight. We have covers reducing our sunlight. And so this is just stressing that we need to be moving towards planar canopies if, if we're trying to put them under covers to really optimize um, photosynthesis and the cost of that space under the cover. We found over time that trees will grow much better, uh, reduced evapotranspiration, et cetera, to reduce wind. So they can be up to 24% taller, leaf sizes larger, um, trunk girth is increased under tunnels compared to outside tunnels, lateral shoot length is increased. As I mentioned, fruit size is increased. And so the one of the challenges for moving to the other stone fruits beyond cherry is that peaches, apricots, and plums don't have dwarfing rootstocks. So how do we maintain tree um, height under a, a limited cover uh, without a dwarfing rootstock? And that's where, as we move to these multi-leader uh, training systems, exactly like Mikhail showed, four leaders, you, you manage that vigor of each of those individual leaders so much better than a single or a two liter tree. So this is how we now uh, use uh, a very precise matrix for developing our um, UFO sweet cherries. We've done the same sort of thing with apricots, plums, and we're working on peaches. Peaches are a little more challenging because they don't fruit on spurs, they fruit on uh, last year's shoots. So you have to space those upright fruiting offshoots uh, farther apart. Um, but you can see here, commercial orchard of UFO cherries in New Zealand, how narrow that is. Note the black lines above them. This orchard has covers over it. Here are super slender ax cherries in Italy. Uh, single leaders on very dwarfing rootstocks. Again, note the ease of covering. Here are bi-axis uh, SSA cherries in Italy. Again, orchard covers. And one of the final things to note is when you have such a narrow canopy, um, as we move to tower sprayers that have individually activated nozzles and the future of sensor mapping of canopies that can turn these nozzles on and off to spray uh, only where needed, um, a planar canopy um, is going to allow you to uh, be much more precise in pesticide application and reduce the amount of pesticide even over and above under a cover, which eliminates some of those fungal diseases, some of those insect pests, et cetera. So kind of to conclude, uh, the advances in tree fruit production, looking at both planar canopies and canopy modifying covers um, are such that if you're using a very planar canopy, like a UFO, an SSA, or an espalier, you're going to maximize a lot of potential benefits um, under the covers, as well as just the physiology of the tree. Both of those technologies will improve fruit quality. Both will improve higher labor efficiency, being able to work in a more efficient uh, canopy structure, as well as being able to work in weather conditions that may be less than optimal uh, outside. These facilitate new orchard imaging technologies they can improve spray coverage, reduce pesticide use. Um, and so with that, uh, I just wanted to give you all of those things to think about. And then, Mike, I'm happy to uh, just take questions. All right. Thank you so much, Greg. You certainly given me plenty to think about. I know my head's spinning with, with all the great examples you just gave me and really exciting stuff. So I'd like to open up for questions for Greg. Um, looks like Jeremy... Has something in the chat box here. Um, here in New Hampshire, we have three blueberry producers using exclusion netting for SWD. I wondered how much of a role reflective light plays in disorienting or repelling the insect. Any thoughts on that, Greg? I'm sorry, say that again. I'm trying to figure out how to get back to Zoom here. Oh, Wait, sure. Yep. Question again. So the question was, um, how much of a role reflect the reflective light plays in disorienting or repelling SWD 
and blueberry plantings. Do you have any thoughts on that based on what you mentioned earlier? No, since I'm a physiologist, I've I've done no studies with SWD. Talking with my entomology friends, they've uh, talked about SWD not liking direct sunlight, but liking that diffused light and a little bit of shade. And so I know that my entomology friends have hypothesized, gee, I wonder if these narrow planar canopies would be less conducive to SWD infestation, but I don't know of anyone who's actually done a study on that in, in along those lines. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I remember, I forget who from Michigan was did the pruning study on the tart cherries, and I think they mentioned similarly, the, the more pruning you do and the brighter and less humid you get it, you know, the less of an issue they tend to be. So, you know, certainly going along those lines, that, that certainly seems to make sense. I think that was Nikki Rothwell. Oh, okay. That was Nikki. Thanks. So I was wondering, um, and again, others feel free to jump in with questions, but um, I mean, just in terms of grower adoption in Michigan, are are you seeing a lot of shift towards protected systems for cherries and other stone fruits? Or um, what? where do you see the industry going in the next 10, 15 years, I guess? Well, I know we have... Um... The company here in Michigan, River Ridge, which packs about 50% of our apples, they are uh, really making a huge investment in sweet cherries. And uh, in doing so, they are planning to put covers over uh, the bulk of those those sweet cherries. Um, they, I know that their first trial, they said they paid off their first orchard in six years. Um, and one of those years, I think they lost the crop and they um all they uh, i think market primarily down into chicago so our cherries don't have to go very far there's there's big markets nearby with chicago indianapolis detroit cleveland um but they need to capture that shelf space and be able to guarantee it year in and year out not not uh, have a, a rainstorm um wipe out their their production and so they are are investing heavily in covers i think that when our other fresh market sweet cherry growers see if River Ridge goes out of business or if they they make this a success, um, we'll see a lot of people follow along. We've been doing the, the covered research for 20 years now, as I said, and River Ridge has been the first to really take it up in any scale. And I think other growers are waiting to see, well, let's see a grower make it work as opposed to a scientist, um, you know, how, how um, artificial we do our, our, our trials. Sure, certainly. And what type of covering are is River Ridge doing out of the examples you gave? So they are using, I think, pr at this stage, primarily the bone uh, row covers, which cover individual rows, but then they zip together or they clip together uh, to create create a pretty much a solid um, covering on the top. And they are um, dropping netting down on the sides, I believe, uh, for some insect exclusion um, at certain times as well. And bird and bird netting, I think. Okay, thank you. I'm just checking the chat box here. Glenn mentioned he doesn't have a citation, but um, in raspberries and blueberries, opening up the canopy is going to reduce SWD pressure. Um, Anna dropped in a link to a study on that. I know of a grower that is looking at planting sweet cherries in an orchard where he is using solar panels. He hopes the panels will provide coverage for the trees. Any comments on, on that combination, solar panels and cherries? That's a hot area of research right now. I know that there's research going on <clears throat> in Chile, um, in cherry orchards with solar panels. Um, I've seen uh, some of that research in Europe uh, as well as in Australia. And at this point, it's, it's very early stages of that research. Um, in Australia, the work was going on over pears, and they did see a decrease in pear quality with the types of panels they were using. It's really going to come down to orientation of the rows, the, the narrowness of the rows, and the narrowness of the solar panels. Uh, you certainly have to have light that comes through. Um, if, if, if the solar panels are intercepting all of the light, then you know, what's the right width of the panel? Should it be one meter wide uh, with a gap of two meters? Should it be a meter and a half wide with a gap of a meter and a half? Those are the kinds of questions that need to be worked out and will probably change 
by latitude um, for areas that have higher or lower light. I truly believe it's going to be the future because we've seen that we can create some shade at some point during the day and not lose uh, too much photosynthesis. So why not do that with a solar panel? Um, I think we've done some calculations with the narrow UFO canopy architecture that if we put the solar panel directly over uh, the row of trees at solar noon, that's when we'd get our greatest shade. But the bulk of the morning and the bulk of the afternoon, you have incidental light coming in uh, from the sides. And that's when you actually see the, the majority, the, the, the most photosynthesis going on because you have that full column of leaves uh, illuminated. Uh, at solar noon, the, the leaves at the top of the, the column are illuminated and the leaves below are shaded. That's the only time you get any significant shade in a UFO. So putting the solar panel directly over a very narrow row of trees probably would not negatively influence the production, but would capture that uh, solar electricity. Wow, very interesting. All right, thank you so much, Greg. Any other last questions for Greg before we move to Terrence? All right, thank you, Greg. We're gonna transition over now, um, invite Terrence to share his screen and tell us about growing tree fruit undercover in Northern Minnesota. Hmm. Oh, yep. Yep, I think if you go to the top there and click on slideshow and then it there should we just go. start it. Okay. There we go. Okay. I didn't know. Can everybody hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. So, well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a little different here in northern Minnesota. That's what I kind of really wanted to talk about here today of some of the problems that we had, um, even though Minnesota is, is great for its um, variety of, of tree fruit, especially apples here with um, development of Honeycrisp and um, Death Star and Harrelson and First Crisp and First Kiss and several of the others here. Um, we, we are a pretty tight, tough state, so to speak. Now, most of the research that I do um, or lived up here is up in here. We're somewhere around 100 miles, maybe 120 miles from the Canadian border, which puts us pretty cold. We're also at about 1,500 um, foot above sea level. And we are basically the coldest part of the United States that's not in the mountains or, or much higher um, um, altitude. So with that, we do have our growing problems here. And most of our, first, I just wanna say these here, are the yellow dots are growers that we have um, growing some type of um, research with us in high tunnel. A lot of it's observational research, but we're just trying to get a handle on this. We started our research in the mid um, 1990s and um, it's kind of mo moving forward. And we basically started a lot with uh, more with vegetables, just got it in into um, tree fruit here in um, around 15, 14, um, something like that. So um, so what's our problem up here? Well, basically the our situation is, is, is cold and wind. Um, cold temperatures of a minus 50 degrees are, are not unheard of. Um, even though we usually only get a couple of a couple of them a year, but we get a lot of minus 35, high wind, snow, ice, that type of stuff. So growing fruit trees up this far north in this particular area here um, is is just about impossible. If you can put them in and get them up, get them into five and get them moving in five years, you still don't have a lot of growth on them. Um, if you can make them make them survive at all. So um, this experiment station is basically the um, farthest um, um, experiment station in the continental United States. Um, and we always get plants and plant material and everything from 
many, many states and around the world that we do testing for for our for our winter, usually a five year program, but um, some, sometimes they don't make it five years, sometimes they do. So what got us into this um, high tunnel situation here with, with tree fruit up here is, is basically, will the high tunnels basically cause this to survive? And the real question is that we had is, is it the cold that damages and kills the tree? Or is it actually the environmental aspects such as wind? Well, one of my students was playing around and he went out and he got some apple trees that were very, very young and um, cut the stems open and we looked them under a microscope and you can see just tons and tons of damage, um, cell damage, um, bark damage, everything outside. And of course, we don't have to think too far that that's pretty, pretty critical um, situation. So that, that's what kind of got us started into this high tunnel um, fruit production. Number one, we're basically able to, um, to make them survive and then we want to study growth and, and leaders and that type of, of things here. This is just a shot of one of our um, of our growers farm there that, that does work for us here. This is just a shot of the three tunnels that we were using to go ahead and, um, and do um, small fruit, um, apples, and we kind of have them mixed up now. But um, so these are the kind of tunnels we use. We have a lot of hay groves in Minnesota um, in the northern part, but you know that's not a thing for winter protection. Um, when, you know, we, we have a vast amount of snow load that we, um, that we, that we have. So I just want to talk about some of the first ones that we did. Um, and I'm switching gears into grapes because we have a lot of research on them before we get into apples, if that's, um, if that's okay here. Um, so what we did is we took several varieties of grapes that barely make it in Minnesota, much less in the upper parts of uh, Minnesota. And um, these are just some of the varieties that we use, um, Frontenac Marquette, Frontenac Blanc, La Crescent, um, Frontenac Gris, Jupiter, and, um, and, and others here. And some of them are, them are, if you recognize them, they're table grapes, very, very, very touchy when it comes to, um, um, should you say, um, bad weather. So we have a grower that was next to our experiment station that wanted to actually do this. He was more interested in wine grapes, but we did get him to, into, into um, 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 some of the more tender grapes. Let me look here, this is not where I wanna be here. Come here, okay. There. Some of our apples. Let me back up here. There, okay. So what we actually did is we, we planted the grapes in one year. And um, you can see we had a, a tremendous amount of growth. This is actually second year. The first year we took the grapes and we went ahead and just laid them right flat on the floor um, with some mouth poison and that type of stuff and um, put straw on them. And the survival rate on all the varieties was nearly 100% while outside it was close to about um, 80 to 90% that they did not survive here out of the um, same varieties. So we were really um, pleased with that. One of the things you notice here, we did experiment with several of the um, covers, uh, anywhere between 50 and 90%, um, basically in the spring, because um, we don't want them grapes coming out of dormancy, you know, way, way too early. Now, I will say most of the high tunnel producers or four season um, tunnels in, in Minnesota have some type of heat in, in, in them, unless they're just, you know, not gonna plant into June. So it's not heat to grow anything. It's just kind of heat to keep the frost out of them 
um, when it when it doesn't get cold because we can see, you know, 17, 18 degrees here the the third week in May sometimes after everything has um, um, blossomed out. So the grapes did very, very well, all the different um, varieties here. This is a shot here of some of them that we experimented with where we did not actually cover the um, um, vines um, on some of the tender ones and just put a little straw around the base of them. Here you can see it was um, completely covered around the base of them and it just really didn't uh, make a lot, a lot of difference. Um, at least in them particular years. Now, I'll admit the last three, four years here, we've been pretty mild, but um, before that, we it's been really, really tough. So um, let me see here. So just, again, um, plant it um, a couple of years ago here. You can basically see how these things pros prospered here. Uh, Marquette grapes, um, in first year, we we're up around 11. Um, then up to 75, 46, and um, 114, 34, and 125. And it just continues to um, get better and better. The, the light intensity up here is a little bit different. We do have about two weeks out of the year that you can drive your tractor, go outside, do anything you want without lights. And I think that the growing time um, really increases during them two to three weeks. The, the growth that's put on is, is basically um, unbelievable. So we need to really watch the daily fertility through the drip tape, through um, foliar applications, and every other way that we can keep this product up. And of course, calcium uptake has been our, our biggest problem, just like the first speaker said in his, um, when we get into some honey crisp here, um, you know, it it's it is it is our problem if we don't manage it right. And our university um specialists here that I work with have actually put a tremendous amount of effort into solving um these bitter pit bitter pit problems. So well, we concluded out of that, even though that every year we were into this project, um the plants outside died. Um, for somehow, even though they shovel snow on them, um, they just didn't make it inside the tunnel. They basically did really, really well. Um, we there being that this stuff can't be grown much by the home gardener or anything. The farmers that have went to these type of systems do really well because they get an extremely high price. I don't know if it would work if it was on the um, open market shipping them into Chicago or something like that. I, I don't think the economics would be there, but it did give a lot of um, farmers, market people, and others a, a really big boost on how to grow these. Since then, um, since I retired here in 16, some of the um, specialists are looking at doing this with a lot, lot tender um, grapes um, that the University of Minnesota has developed. So, um, we definitely found out, again, the question basically is, do we have the wind problem destroying it um, or the cold? We think with with um, grapes, it's more cold. Again, the, the, the trick is, um, as I mentioned, we needed something to really cut the light intensity down with almost a 90% um, 90 of cover over them tunnels when the when they could open up and come into bloom. Um, so we needed to delay that as much as possible. Um, and then, then even in the summertime, when we get our June 20th to July 10th long days, um, we also had like a 30% black um, cover over them. And um, that really seems to, to really help. You can get a lot of growth way too fast by us. As far as temperature is concerned, we don't fight temperature like, like you guys. Um, if our years were completely average temperature in the summertime, we would never hit 80 degrees. So, you know, we don't deal with this 90, 95. I, I admit that bright sunlight going through them tunnels at um, 
you know, even 70 degrees or even 50 degrees a lot of times can cause some um, some serious um, um, problems there. So it, it does take management. Um, I think we got maybe 20 tunnels now in the state that are growing um, um, grapes. And most of them are like 30 by 96s or 30 by 120, something of that size to... Um, you know, to produce these grapes um, in, in the years that they, they put them in, they actually put strawberries between the rows and, and other things, too. So, again, it's a very, very intense management type of a thing and, um, you know, something to really think about. Um, I could have spent a whole day talking about grapes. I am going to switch here to apples. Um, does anybody have any questions on grapes at all? Okay, we'll move on to um, apples. So we had the same situation with apples. It's hard up here to make them survive um, over any type of long term. That's why all these apples are really tested up here at our farthest north experiment station here to see basically how long they last. And a lot of stock comes in and um, of course don't make it hardly, hardly a year. So... Um, Need to think about that. So basically in this experiment with this tunnel here, again, we put 14 Honeycrisp in and 26 Zestar along with some other um, tree fruit here. Um, just basically to see if I did this experiment again, I, I put them in at three foot, I would probably go down to two foot, uh, maybe even a foot and run the leaders a lot, um, a lot tighter. Um, so, this is just kind of what they look like. I think we used three quarters stock on them and um, went from there. Now, here we are um, on August 14th and we planted these mid-May. You can kind of really see the, the growth on them and, and how fast they're moving along. Um, the first year we put um, black um, row covering on some of the, or shade cloth, I should say, on some of it. Um, it did slow them down just a little bit, so we actually took it off on this part of the tunnel. Here we got a little bit uh, more growth. Again, it's, it's a thing with apples in our tunnels um, that you have to be sure that they, they you know they'll bloom early they need to be in heated tunnels so um but the yield is is really been fantastic again this is the the first year i think i got another slide here here we are with four months of growth on them keeping the bottoms trimmed and all that you can kind of see at uh, four months they're basically just touching the top of the um tunnels and i think that's up there around 12 feet if i remember right 12, 14 feet. So, you know, that part was very, very successful, but then taking it through the winter was the next situation that was concerning here. What was it basically going to do during the winter? It gets hot all day. I mean, the days are short, of course, but it does get hot um, in them tunnels really quick. So you can see once they went into dormancy, we do have a a 70% shade cloth over the top of them to um, kind of kind of keep us, you know, in darkness. And then the question is, how much do we keep sides rolled up? Um, we did kind of have the side management sometime in the winter when it got down to 35, 40 below. We did have to drop the, the sides down. But um, overall, um, they made it through the winter. The growth was just really excellent here. And as you can see, we didn't prune hard at all um, at this point because we wanted to see if any or what part of the stems would basically be be dead, um, you know, f you know, from the cold. So we're kind of concluding here that it, it's actually more the wind damage, um, ice, and that type of thing when you cut the stems open and looks at them. Of course, these here are all perfect. The ones outside look look pretty rough to say the least. So this part came through here um, pretty well. I just wanted to mention here on, um, let me see, let me back up here. Come on, back up. There we go. Okay. 
Yeah. So again, um, you know, fantastic girls. I was going to show you some pruning pictures here, but I don't know where they went. Um, so there's two things that we really had to use in the tunnel. And as somebody mentioned it, um, bumblebees, we've done a lot of research with our group with um, bumblebees, honeybees in, in high tunnels, even if you have the um, hives right outside, just does not, um, did not work here unless you can completely pull uh, the tops off and, um, and, and, and crank them down, which, you know, most people really can't. So um, it's something to, to really think about here. Um, you need, of course, pollination situation with different varieties and everything else you need to think about here. This is a shot of the, of the second year cherries that were um, in the tunnels. They're cherries here and they're plums here. And the plums, they, the growth on them was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, pruning was just a nightmare. You had to keep them pruned and pruned and pruned in the tunnel. Again, a lot of that's our long days and long a long growing season. Yield wise, um, I didn't include a lot of that data on apples. It was really about a hundred percent, one hundred and ten percent above what it is um, outside, um, even in in a little bit a bit south from us. So we were um, really happy with what came out of this here. We are following it up with um, with additional research and economics to see. I don't have pictures of it, but we have one grower who has three um, 30 by 120s, all full of peaches. And he would be the fellow that um, we would want to talk to with the grief he's had and how he has to keep them peaches completely dark for two months. I mean, completely dark with, with like black, Plastic over them, not row covers or, or um, sunscreen, but actual black plastic to um, to keep them things in dormancy. He does sell his peaches all for in the three dollars or four dollars a pound. They're just fantastic, um, sweet peaches. So we are actually developing now uh, quite a bit of this um, fruit production in in trees. I mean, in high tunnels here in um, northern Minnesota. So that's kind of where I'm going to stop here. I was told I had to keep it down about 20 minutes without showing a lot more, but I would surely entertain any questions anybody has. All right, thank you so much, Terrence. Um, again, if you have questions, feel free to type them in or unmute yourself and ask. Um, Greg did mention he had done some work with uh, wine grapes in Michigan in tunnels and found that it improved vine growth as well as higher yields and better ripening. He did mention that it led to a lot more vigorous growth and mildew really can get out of hand. Um, so Terrence, I, I think, you know, really interesting stuff. Um, I think, you know, you, you essentially answered my question, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll just repeat it here, you know, with working with some growers here in Northern New York, I mean, I know some people that are in zone 3B, 4A, and they want to grow sweet cherries, so, um, and, or peaches, and, you know, so they've been asking me, can I put them in a high tunnel? Um, so, I mean, you know, what would your response to that be? It sounds like it is possible, um, but what are some of the, the caveats that come with that, that you mentioned? Yeah, it is possible. I mean, our zone is basically two. Oof. Um, <laughs> Maybe two A, um, depending on exactly where you're at. So, uh, we we you know sweet cher uh, sweet cherries in tunnels are again I think it's close to like running peaches. Um, I, I would probably say that the darkness, and that's where we're experimenting now as a group here. The darkness and how long you need them in complete darkness and keeping them from breaking dormancy. Again, I don't think that the cold, as we used to think, was the biggest culprit. I think it's just the outside um, environment that you know, caused so much of our damage. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions for Terrence? Um, any benefits to table grapes in terms of sunburn as far as growing these under the tunnel? 
we didn't have any problem with that at all. Um, as a matter of fact, the problem that we, the only insect we had a lot of problem with is mites. Uh, you, I mean, being we're up here in the northern, what we call the northern valley, our average, uh, I shouldn't say average, but most of the time in the summertime, our relative humidity is 20, 25%. So we don't get a lot of the diseases that some other people do now in the tunnel. You have to make sure that you, you keep that down a little bit um, with fans and that type of thing. So um, we are fortunate that way with the outside fruit that we do grow. One of the biggest crops that we do grow here commercially are honeyberries, um, harvested with machines, just like your blueberries down there in Michigan. They will take it to at least the varieties we use will take it to um, a minus 70 degrees and they can be 18 degrees in full blossoms and it won't hurt the blossoms till about 18 degrees, depending on the variety, something like that. So they've picked up quite a bit of success up in this part of the world. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I see we're we're just about pushing 130. So uh, just to be respectful to everyone's time, I, I think we're going to go ahead and end it here. Um, I, I'd just like to thank Michael and, and Greg and Terrence so much for joining us today. Uh, really interesting work for all three of you. And again, just really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your schedules to, to speak with us all today. Um, I did record this, so it'll be up online in the next day or two. And I just wanted to also remind folks that we do have one more of these coming up. I believe that date is around the first week of March. I want to say it's the 7th, but I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, but that discussion is going to be on maiden disruption. Jan's going to be leading that up. And we got a couple different guests that day. Uh, Tracy Lesky is going to be joining us. Ann Nielsen is going to be with us. Uh, so definitely keep that one on your list. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. That next one is March 5th.